Today, you've joined hundreds of established and emerging writers who are discovering ways to reach their writing goals and have fun by being more curious, creative, and productive. You're listening to Ann Croker, Writing Coach. This is episode 187, Write to Discover Your Ideal Reader. In composition classes, college students learn to identify their audience. Who are they writing for? The Writing Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill suggests students think about writing a letter to their grandmothers about their first month at college. Then they say to imagine writing another letter on the same topic, but this time to their best friend. Unless you have an extremely cool grandma to whom you're very close, it's likely that your two letters would look quite different in terms of content, structure, and even tone. The writing form was the same, a letter, and the topic was the same, the first month at college. The only variable was the audience, the reader, and knowing the reader will affect the writer's choices. In this Write to Discover series, we've explored our top themes and topics and seen that they can be conveyed in a variety of packages, that is, various genres, styles, or forms. As we add in this new element, the reader, we must ask, who will be reading this piece? What does he already know about this topic? Will this reader have certain expectations based on the type of writing, such as a genre with its conventions? As we dig into the reader's demographics and experiences, our examples and language as writers will shift. Our choices will narrow. For example, an essay on recycling written for The Atlantic will be read by a different audience than a children's book about recycling or an article in a women's magazine about recycling. We'll make different choices to suit our reader in order to produce the best possible project. For any given writing project, you have to know your audience. But you may be resisting this basic writing advice. Perhaps you side with writers like Diane Ackerman, who said once in an interview, Actually, I never think of an audience when I'm writing. I just try to write about what fascinates me and to contemplate what disturbs me or provokes me in some way or amazes me. I suppose if I have a philosophy on this, it's that if you set out to nourish your own curiosity and your own intellectual yearnings and use yourself as an object of investigation, then without meaning to, you will probably be touching the lives of a lot of people. With this philosophy, Diane Ackerman's audience would be comprised of, well, people sort of like Diane Ackerman. So while she says she never thinks of an audience, but instead simply writes what disturbs, provokes, or amazes her, she's actually writing for an audience demographic that is close to her own. And it's worked well for her. She's a prolific, successful author of many books, poems, and essays. Even if you resist this idea of an ideal reader, even if you're simply writing what pleases you, you are indeed writing for a certain kind of reader, a reader with characteristics similar to yours. Lee Gutkind, in his book Creative Nonfiction, seeks a balance between writing what you enjoy and keeping the reader in mind. He says this, Writing is a business. The reader is a customer. When you write, you are attempting to create a product that your reader wants to buy or read. Don't get me wrong, you must like what you write and be proud of it. Your article or essay has your name under the title and contains your thoughts and ideas. You are the creator, the person responsible for its existence. But never forget the ultimate reason you are writing nonfiction, to inform, entertain, and influence the readership, however extensive, as in the New Yorker, or limited, as in your school newspaper, it may be. Yes, writing is a selfish art. We write because we want to write. But we also write because we need to make contact with as many other people, readers, as possible, and make an impact in order to influence their thoughts and actions. In our desire to make contact with as many readers as possible to make an impact and influence their thoughts and actions, let's look at your current reader. If you're already writing, you're a published author, or you're a blogger seeing a fair amount of traffic, or you're a poet whose work has appeared in literary journals, you may already have a a following. 
Who is already reading and responding to your work? How would you describe the people who comprise your current audience? Do you know one of your readers personally enough to write a description of him or her? These people are like your VIP members. They're the people who make time for you in their inbox if you send out a newsletter. They pause on your social media update to read the latest. They click through to read articles you've published. They pre-order your forthcoming book. Understand your existing readers and seek to know them. Hopefully, most of them represent the ideal reader you want to reach. But it's possible they grew from a mixture of old high school friends and extended family who enjoyed seeing your early writing efforts. So you may want to write to discover your ideal reader beyond your existing base of subscribers and followers. Darren Rouse of ProBlogger fame has encouraged bloggers to create reader avatars, which he says are also called reader profiles or personas. Sales and marketing teams do the same thing, breaking down their ideal customer profile using demographics and psychographics. Darren recommends taking the time to develop an ideal reader profile to avoid chasing after numbers instead of seeking to engage ideal readers. You'll stop trying to be all things to all people when you have an ideal reader that you're trying to reach. Because those random people you entice to your website or social media channel in an appeal to to the masses and in hopes of raising your numbers, well, they may not stick around because what you're writing ends up irrelevant to them. Plus, you're at risk of writing bland copy, lacking energy when you really don't know the person reading your words. Now, compare that with those readers you draw because you're reaching out to an ideal reader. They'll stick around. Why? Because it's clear that you understand their struggles, their questions and problems. You've written and discovered them by delivering content that seems customized to them. You know the entertainment they crave and can deliver it. You know, years ago, Seth Godin wrote a short piece on his website titled First 10. In it, he recommended anyone in marketing find 10 people who need or want what you offer. As writers, we'd be looking for 10 readers who, in Seth's words, trust you, respect you, need you, listen to you. Write something and see how they respond. Do they love it? Share it with their own 10 friends or followers? Comment on it? Email you about it? Good, Seth would say. It's working. Your ideas are spreading. Your writing is, at least on a small scale, validated. Write more in that vein. Now, did those 10 readers fall silent after you clicked publish and shared it? Did they ignore it? Well, Now you know. You wrote to discover what your ideal reader would respond to, and apparently that wasn't it. Try writing something else, something different, something new. And if those readers are still with you, test their reaction to your next offering, and so on. It's a simple approach to figure out what to write next. And it's a simple approach to find and keep ideal readers. After all, some new readers will join you when one of your original ten shared one of your pieces. Over time, your growing tribe of ideal readers will stick around as you deliver them what they need and want. While it's fun to publish at your own website or on social media channels, you're not restricted to what you can write and publish in your own spaces. Don't forget you can reach out to places where you think your ideal readers hang out, on their favorite social media channels, on websites they frequent, Once you find those places, you could pitch article and guest post ideas so that you write to discover readers on the very channels and websites they frequent. You'll show up in the magazines they read. Back in the early blogging days, people recommended leaving comments at influential websites. Well, why not try that now? That's another way to write to discover your ideal readers in that flow of interaction in response to someone's ideas. Plus, in your well-written comment, You get to thank and support the original writer whose work complements your own. It makes this literary world a better place. Also, be sure you're creating a fascinating website of your own that appeals to this ideal reader. It's your home base. When a curious reader discovers you somewhere, he's going to hop over to learn more about you. So be sure more ideal content awaits them so they confirm you're a writer who relates to them and then consistently serve them. 
When you consistently serve people who are gaining value from your writing, who get you because you get them, you're developing a loyal audience who will show up to read what you've written time and again. By encouraging us to serve readers, I'm not necessarily recommending we write to market or write for the commercial market. I mean, unless you want to. It can be fun and rewarding to write to market. That is to figure out the top performing genres and subgenres and then learn to write novels that fit well in that market. But that's another topic for some other time. My point is that you don't need to write exclusively to please others. Whatever writing you undertake, it needs to be something you enjoy doing, something you're eager to work on, even if it's hard. As Lee Gutkin said, yes, writing is a selfish act. We write because we want to write. But he points out that we also write to serve an audience, readers, and we hope to reach as many as possible to make a difference in their lives. Otherwise, we'd just write in a journal, and at the end of the day, we'd just shove it under the mattress for safekeeping. But no, we're writers seeking to discover and serve our ideal readers. And maybe it does just start with 10. First, 10. If you can discover and serve 10 ideal readers, well, frankly, that sounds like a great place to start. I'm Ann Croker cheering you on as a writing coach in your ear. Everywhere we may meet, at my website, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, in your inbox, here on this podcast, over at Patreon, or even in person, I'm always looking for ideas to share with you that will help you achieve your writing goals and have fun by being more curious, creative, and productive. Thank you for listening.